while the life of resurrection is the Christian life, you only get there through the cross. And it's a daily expression of surrender that invites the spirit of resurrection. Grab your Bibles and open to um, Matthew 26. I have uh, uh, quite a, a different word than I normally bring. I've got several verses here that I, if I don't feel I have the time to look them up, I've got them ready. Um, Jesus never invited anyone to follow him so they would be blessed. He never used prosperity. He never used success. You know, he didn't come to the political zealot that he had to follow him as a disciple. He, never, he didn't come to him and say, listen, I'll make you successful as a great politician if you follow me. He didn't come to... Peter and say, I'll make you the most blessed fisherman ever if you follow him. He didn't do any of that. He didn't entice anyone with blessing to follow him, which is fascinating because his kingdom carries such a boatload of blessing. It, it, it reminds me of Jesus says, there's a straight and narrow way into the kingdom. It's a narrow road. Jesus himself is the door. And uh, it, it's a narrow road that leads into the kingdom. Once you're in the kingdom, the kingdom is very vast and very broad. But entrance is only one way. And it's the entrance of discipleship. It's the entrance of the cross. It's embracing what is foolishness to all who are without Christ. Paul says in Corinthians that that he preaches the cross, the cross, that which is foolishness to those who are perishing, but yet it's the wisdom of God to those who are being saved. And I love that phrase, being saved, because I was saved, but I'm also being saved, and someday I'm gonna be saved. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. these three dimensions of salvation that are absolutely the heart of the gospel. I, I was saved X amount of years ago. I gave my life to Christ. But there is a work that's going on right now where I'm, I'm being saved, and someday, I will see him face to face and he will complete what was started. But here in this talk that I wanna to do today, I'm gonna to bring up an unusual story that we're familiar with and it's the betrayal of Judas. The context for the betrayal, I gotta be honest with you, I've been reading this, studying this for a lifetime, you know, since I was 18 and I've never seen before the context for his betrayal. So let's take a look at it. Matthew 26, did I tell you where? No. no? Matthew 26. How many of you were already there? I want to see how many prophetic people. There are, there are quite a few of you. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Matthew, Matthew 26. Some of you were already there. That's kind of frightening to me. I, they, I did say it. I said the chapter, but not the verse. You guys are starting to scare me now. It's, it, you know, in the early days of the renewal, we would discuss things in private as a staff. We'd make plans. And somebody in the church would have some dream. We couldn't do anything because the Lord would tell everybody the secrets that we had as the staff. We need to do this. We need to plan this. And somebody would prophesy, you know, and we'd go, come on. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we keep a few secrets, you know? <laughs> All right, Matthew 26, verse one. It came to pass... When Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know, after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Take a look at verse two again. You know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people assembled at the palace, the high priest who's called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Jump down to verse 14. Then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. 
Let's take a look at the context here. What are the disciples anticipating with Jesus? We see it in their dialogues. We see it in uh, John, James and John's mother talking to Jesus. Can my, can my boy sit at your right hand and your left? They are all vying for a, a political posture of power. They are looking for Israel to be vindicated and restored to a place of prominence. And can I say, a place of political prominence and political power. They are each looking because they are disciples of Jesus, they will be brought into this empire of rule and will each have their place of influence and significance. When did Judas betray Jesus? When he finally realized, it's not gonna happen that way and I'll live my place of political prominence. <clears throat> Selfish ambition undermines discipleship and actually sets us up for betrayal. The sobering part of the story, which we don't have time to look at all of it, but the sobering part of the story is all of the disciples abandoned Jesus at his moment. Peter was the most vocal. The one that had no return was Judas. But they all had some measure of betrayal. And I'd like to suggest when they lost their place, their position, their prominence, they suddenly had to apply the concept of the cross in a way different than they had expected. I'm reminded of a, what I think is a funny story anyway of the guy who's climbing this cliff <clears throat> and he gets up so far that he knows he can't go back down but he's afraid he's going to die if he tries to climb any higher and he just kind of gets stuck and he cries out for help and a voice comes back and says, yes, this is the Lord, I'm here to help you. And he says, what do I do? And the Lord says, let go first. And he yells out, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> do I have any other options? Most of us, our concept of the cross is self-inflicted. Instead of embracing the circumstances of life that require something from us that we were not expecting. Jesus did not hang himself on the cross did not crucify himself, nor did he raise himself from the dead. Yes. It's important to remember that because while the life of resurrection is the Christian life, yes. you only get there through the cross. Yes. And it's a daily expression of surrender that invites the spirit of resurrection. Yes. The spirit of resurrection is not at our disposal in the sense that I can direct it or control it. At will say, I will now have the spirit of resurrection on my finances, the blessing of the Lord on my family or whatever. It's, it's not in my control. What's in my control is surrender. In my control is to create a platform for the spirit of resurrection to come and do something in me and through me that testifies of grace. But Jesus gave himself to crucifixion to a cross, to death, trusting he would be raised. He did not lay there for three days going, yeah, it should be about time to get up. <laughs> he did not raise himself. He was resurrected by the spirit of resurrection through the Father. That is perhaps the best, the ultimate illustration of the crosswalk of a disciple. Here's the fa a fascinating part of this journey for me. <clears throat> is found in the verses, actually there's two things that I want to point to. The first is found in the verses between what I read where Jesus announced the crucifixion and Judas's betrayal. So I want you to look at that part of the story. It's in verse six, when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it at his, on his head as he sat at the table. And when his disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Jump down to verse, the last half of verse 13. What this woman has done, Jesus says, will be told as a memorial to her. I personally think you'll be able to review that story in heaven. 
And I think the Lord will throughout eternity unveil layer after layer after layer of the beauty of heaven, the beauty of sacrifice that this woman offered to honor Jesus at his, at his death and uh, his burial. It says the disciples raised a voice in complaint about this waste. Unbelief will always evaluate extravagant giving as waste. This gift that was given was equal to a year's income. We've heard this countless times. A year's worth of income, and this woman takes it and pours it out, and the disciples begin to bicker. Why this waste? John chapter 12 tells us it was actually Judas who led the charge as he complained against this woman who wasted a year's worth of income. For illustration, let's just say, as everybody watches, $50,000 evaporate before their eyes. There was only one person in the room that celebrated the moment, that understood the moment. Two celebrated, the woman and Jesus. But sometimes you do things honestly for an audience of one. It's only for him, and only he gets it. Only he gets it. John 12 says Judas was the one who complained against this offering, this sacrifice. And it says it's because Judas was a thief. And he wanted that to be sold, put in the treasury, because he was the treasurer, because he would steal money from the treasury for himself. It's fascinating to me how morality demands expression. So here we have somebody with secret sin, taking money that was given to Jesus, personal, privately, holding it off for themselves, and pointing at the waste of someone else. Hidden sin invites the spirit of accusation. Why? Because there's something in us that it's like morality values demand expression. So you'll see it, maybe a silly example, but you'll see it with the mafia as they contend for family. Unrighteous lifestyle, righteous position. Or those who are the strongest in promoting abortion will defend the right of the baby whale or something else. And it's not to mock the animal rights thing. It's to say there's something broken and oftentimes people will try to cover it with a righteous expression. We saw it back in the 80s as different Christian leaders, the strongest who would criticize immorality or they themselves, the one practicing hidden sin. It doesn't mean we don't address these issues at all. It just means it needs to come out of, out of our obedience, not our effort to silence our own shame. It's, I find it humorous although I've made these mistakes myself, but I find it humorous the way some people will confess their sin. For example, Jesus convicts you of being lazy. Instead of saying to your friend, I need you to pray for me, I'm lazy, what we say is, I need you to pray for me, I lack discipline. Jesus never convicts for lack. He convicts for something that's wrong. And true confession owns up to the whole picture doesn't try to make a soft, a soft edge so that I look better. Have you ever apologized to somebody? I remember doing this as a young man, coming to somebody apologizing, saying, God has really convicted me and I need to, I need to apologize to you. I, I said something harsh to you and I, forgive me. Why did I need to say God has really convicted me? Because I want to appear spiritual. That even in my sin, I am a strong spiritual person. Are you getting this? There's this effort to protect ourselves and what we actually are doing is protecting ourselves from the full effect of the cross. 
Because it's the genuine cross that leads to genuine resurrection. Yeah, I'm so glad that you uh, watched this video. I do pray that it's a great, great strength and encouragement to you. And I've got a verse that really is my cry for all of us. And it's uh, Psalms 20, it's verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That's my prayer. That's my prayer is that this would be the season of rich, rich fulfillment. Thanks for joining us.